section twenty of our search for a wilderness by mary blair bb this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter ten jungle life at aremu some pages from my diary continued by c william bb for our supply of meat we depended altogether upon the efforts of an indian hunter who made daily excursions from the clearing after game and who never failed to come back heavily laden with some one of eight or ten varieties of edible birds or mammals he was an arawak going by the name of francis his real indian name being of course never revealed like most of the indians we met he was quiet serious and taciturn but i had the good fortune early to win his approbation and to satisfy him that while my hunting clothes were no match for his copper-colored skin in stalking animals yet i could manage to get through the woods without any great noise or bustle the only personal information i could obtain from him was that he was born on the upper mazaruni had a brother and two sisters and was about forehand twenty years old he got fifty cents a day and his food for hunting and slept in a tiny hammock swung beneath the bungalow floor the indian hunter at hoorie was paid sixty-eight cents a day without rations francis and i had some interesting tramps together and one of my most enjoyable memories of these great tropical jungles is of this little red man short well-built muscular and absolutely tireless i found him to be a great help in searching for certain rare birds and animals and i learned a good deal of jungle craft from him as one example among many things i noticed that he never stepped on a log or fallen tree and it was not until i had crashed through and hurt my ankle on one which had been undermined by ants that i realized how excellent a rule this was a log of apparently the hardest wood might be but a shell thin as paper the facility with which francis found his way about in rain as well as sunshine was a puzzle until by careful watching i found he was constantly making new trails by breaking in the direction of the trail tiny twigs the leaves of which were of a slightly different color beneath such a mark every fifteen or twenty feet was almost a hopeless clue for me at first although ultimately i learned to discover them more readily as the breaking made no noise and was accomplished by the least motion of the hand it was long before i detected it when i went out alone i chose to leave a blaze every ten feet march thirtieth at daybreak we started out on our first tramp i with camera bag gun and glasses half a mile from the clearing i cached the camera and bag the pace being such that i could not keep up while carrying them i have hunted in canada and elsewhere with first-rate guides and backwoodsmen but this was a very different matter from the moment we entered the jungle the whole demeanor of francis was changed he walked like a cat and never for a moment relaxed his vigilance and therein he differed from a white man who would unconsciously relax when he thought game was still some distance away his figure slipped silently on ahead of me flowing under trunks passing around the densest clumps of underbrush while i followed and imitated as best i could learning every minute more than i had ever known of the art of effacing oneself in the wilderness every step was made carefully and the entire field of view ahead swept and every significant sound noted a branch would fall with a series of resounding crashes and the indian would apparently not hear it while a cracking twig or a low rustle which i could scarcely detect 
would lead him off in an entirely new direction not necessarily toward the sound but often to flank it or get to leeward of it during the first two or three hours we would give our whole attention to hunting but when the day's supply was provided we then stalked the birds and wild creatures and watched them as closely as we could our first tramp was in a general south or southeast direction passing over a succession of hills five in all three of which were high and quite steep but all of about the same diameter with regular slopes and flat narrow valleys these were mostly swampy or if dry had a stream flowing slowly along the middle agoutis were abundant in such places and we could always depend on obtaining them when desired as we left the bungalow i had laughingly asked mrs wilshire what meat she desired for dinner and she said venison so when i told francis in the broken english which we must use in talking to these indians that we must get deer he nodded and disdained the agoutis if i had said francis we must be sure to get deer to-day in preference to other game he would have understood not a word but shoot em deer eh no akuri no laba no maipuri outlined the day's work perfectly in his mind i was rather reluctant to use this um ug language at first it savored too much of the theatrical indian dialect or of penny dreadful wild west jargon but it soon became perfectly natural and was really necessary after a half hour's walk francis motioned me to take the greatest care and pressed my shoulder lower until i was almost on my knees while we slowly crept around a great mora trunk he pointed steadily ahead but after a three-minute scrutiny i could discern not a sign of life then he raised his gun and fired and set loose a half dozen feathered bombs or so it sounded as a flock of nearly full-grown guiana crested tinamou arose with a roar i secured one with a quick snap shot and we tied up the brace of birds with a slender tough bush thread fastening head feet and wings together the indian tied them ingeniously around his waist the birds hanging down behind out of the way at the sound of the guns three tiny male purple-throated euphonias clad in purple jackets yellow caps and waistcoats came down to see what the noise was about they were ridiculously tame and sang their simple chattering song in our very faces in the fourth valley we found a perfect maze of agouti tracks mingled with the fresh imprint of a tapir's feet francis showed me the spot where he had shot one of these bush cows the week before a few yards beyond we found a deer's track and in some way the indian seemed to know that the animal was close at hand we crawled silently for twenty or thirty yards through a shallow creek then separated and crept along the slope one on each side a sudden rustling of vines came from a bend in the stream and we both caught sight of the bright rufous flanks of a deer we secured it and then for some reason francis remained perfectly quiet for five minutes while a delightful bit of wilderness life appeared close to me the smoke from my gun was still clinging to the great fern fronds overhead when a second deer a doe walked fearlessly past along the opposite slope stopping to nibble at a leaf now and then and at last vanished into the underbrush i was about to climb down to the deer we had shot when i heard a splash and a weak little bleat and looking at a pool ahead there i spied the tiniest of fawns standing in the shallows looking full at me and now and then splashing the water i whistled 
and the little thing started toward me fearlessly, standing knee-deep in the water, its tiny rufous form decorated with three lines of spots, every one of which was perfectly reflected in the water. Suddenly, with a snort and a stamp, the mother took one leap over a bush, her eyes staring in terror at me, then turned and vanished. In some way she had infused the spirit of fear into her offspring, for with a bleat, which was almost a shriek, the little fellow galloped madly, awkwardly after her, tripping every few steps as he turned his head to see if this awful thing was pursuing. I never saw such an instantaneous change from confidence to fear in any creature. The most remarkable thing was that the mother and fawn had not taken fright at the roar of the guns in their very ears. The very loudness and proximity must have had a numbing effect on the organs of hearing. I found that Francis had seen the second deer after shooting at the first, and had lain flat while she walked so near him that, as he showed me by her tracks, he could have reached out his hand and touched her as she passed. We know but little of the deer of this region, and I took some notes on this first savanna deer, Odocoileus savanarum, which we obtained for the mess. It was a male without horns, and of a uniform rich rufous above with grayish-brown head, and the legs up to the hock moose color. The tip and underside of the tail and inner thighs were white, while the rufous color was continuous around the breast and belly. The deer stood twenty-four and one-half inches high at the shoulder and weighed seventy pounds. It had been feeding on leaves and on the great number of seeds of the caracali tree, much like the mora. The seeds look like nutmeg in the mace and two grow in each husk. The skill and rapidity with which Francis prepared the animal for carrying was remarkable. He removed eight-foot strips of bark from a small tree, which he called Mahu, and stripped off the tough, pliable inner layer. With this he bound the legs and head together, then tied a broad band of bark about the body, leaving it loose at the top. I hoisted up the deer and he put his arms and shoulders through the tied legs as if it had been a pack bag and slipped the loose band of bark across his forehead like the tump lines of the canadian indians a gentle cool breeze was blowing down the narrow valley and the blood from cleaning the animal had not been exposed five minutes when a line of burying beetles and yellow wasps began coming upwind to the feast. Such a summons calls them far and wide from their vantage points on leaves and branches, where we see them so frequently in walking through the jungle. Before fifteen minutes had passed, an orange-headed vulture appeared soaring over the little opening in ever-lessening circles. He too had responded, but as much by sight as by scent to the welcome meal. On the way home we frightened a group of large weasel-like creatures, which we found to be teras, Galictus barbara, or as the natives call them, hackas. Seven ran rapidly away, snarling, and I secured one. They had been feeding on big grubs, which they had nosed out among the dead leaves, a rather remarkable occupation for creatures of the fierce Mustelidae family. The fur was dark brown with a white spot on the breast, while the tail was long and bushy. Before we reached the clearing, a quadrille bird sang to us from the heart of a tangled swamp, a new theme differing from any I had heard. During the four-mile walk to the clearing, there was hardly a minute when we were out of sight or sound of birds. Big blue Tinamou and Jacupiba guans boomed up before us. 
woodpeckers and mannequins of several species called and flew here and there while we passed flock after flock of ant birds wood hewers flycatchers and tanagers one bird which i secured the wallace olive mannequin was altogether of a dull olive with none of the brilliant color patches of its congeners when i went to pick up the specimen i saw a curious jointed band lying across it and found a six inch centipede on the bird the mannequin must have fallen across the path of the myriapod as it was crawling over the jungle floor while wrapping up this bird a flock of tiny brown fronted jungle vireos flew close to us uttering a song like a diminutive alarm clock whir chi whir chi francis shot one which was hardly more than four inches in length olive green above paler below those who think that all tropical birds are brightly colored should see the great number of species of sober little fellows like these march thirty first francis and i started out in a light rain at daybreak in search of trumpeters and howling monkeys the cook was well supplied with meat so we did not intend to bother with game with the help of goeldi's plates of brazilian birds and much crude attempt at sketching i had taught francis what creatures i wished especially to see about three hundred yards from the clearing francis pointed out a beautiful nest of a white-throated robin made of green growing moss and placed close to the trunk of a tree about six feet from the ground we marked the spot and went on but a day or two later i returned and examined it more carefully this thrush is olive brown above pale below with a streaked chin and throat like our northern robin its most characteristic mark however is a patch of pure white on the upper breast which flashes out like a star among the shadows of the jungle the parent was shy and would slip off at my approach but return as silently if i walked away for a minute when i prepared to photograph the nest she thought something was seriously wrong and voiced her alarm with a sharp cut cut when i focused close to her home her anger got the better of her and she scolded me roundly with harsh notes repeated in phrases of seven chick 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 the nest touched the trunk of the tree but rested on a loop of two inch bush rope or liana which swung against the bark binding one tree to another just below was a fungoid excrescence larger than the nest itself the nest was a double one the new one being built directly on the older the latter was composed of dry dead moss while the new one was fresh and green there were two eggs pale blue green thickly spotted with brown of various shades much more densely at the larger end we found this robin was a common breeder hereabouts and discovered four other nests all within a half mile of the clearing yet all in deep jungle the parents differed radically in their actions two allowing us to inspect their treasures without fear while two others became terrified if we approached within twenty feet of their nest to return to our trumpeter and howling monkey hunt it rained much of the morning but for the most part only a drizzle francis said that wet weather made bad hunting except for deer and bush cow or tapir chiefly because the continual noise made by the falling raindrops made it difficult to hear the rustlings of birds and animals i thoroughly enjoyed this new aspect of the jungle world as usual small birds were fairly abundant of which apparently ninety nine per cent were ant birds or wood hewers the most common ant bird in the valleys was the scaly backed slate colored except for the feathers of the back wings and tail which were black tipped with white at one place two dozen of these little birds must have been in sight uttering sharp snapping calls and clinging like marsh wrens 
to upright stems in the low underbrush. Every now and then we came across a good-sized hole with fresh earth thrown out at the entrance. Francis said that this was made by a yasi, and he recognized an armadillo when I drew it. Suddenly the rain came down in sheets and streamed through the dense foliage. Francis gave me his gun, ran to a turu palm, a species which has no stem but sends its leaves fern-like from a base level with the earth. He cut off five stalks with as many blows of his knife, brought them to me, and stuck them upright in the fork of a low branch. We stood under them for half an hour, and never a drop came through, although three inches out in any direction the rain was falling in torrents. It was a wonderful example of a waterproof shelter put up in about thirty seconds. Can we blame these Indians for a general lack of industry when game is as easy to obtain as we found it, and when one may build a house in half a minute with a few knife strokes? During the entire downpour we saw only a long-tailed hummingbird, which unconcernedly searched the undersides of leaves for insects. Francis said its nest was hung on the side of the tip of a turu frond. A fluted tree of large size near us he called Balakusan, saying it was used for making paddles like Ruruli. A section would look something like this. The folds, when cut off, are so thin that a very little additional shaping forms them into blades. As we were walking along after the shower, several twigs fell on us, which would have been unnoticed by me, as leaves and even branches are continually dropping in these forests. But Francis looked up at once, and whispering, Baboon, pointed to where a great male red howler, Mycestes seniculus, was walking slowly along a branch overhead. A carefully aimed shot brought it to earth, stone dead. It was a magnificent specimen, weighing just twenty pounds, and the hyoid bone protruded like an exaggerated Adam's apple. These howling monkeys are, of course, not really baboons, as these latter monkeys live only in the old world and have short tails, while the howlers are members of the American family Sibidiae. They are of a low type of intelligence and will not live long in captivity, being morose and sullen very unlike other smaller South American primates. The hyoid bones in the throat are enlarged to form a great thin-walled bony drum, which is the chief instrument in the production of their wonderful voice. There were two females and a smaller male in this party, but I got no clear sight of the others after I shot the old one. As in the case of the deer, tiny burying beetles began coming within two minutes after the blood of the baboon had been splashed on the leaves we had walked for ten or fifteen minutes after shooting the monkey when we heard an infantilic roar from the remaining male this the old one would never have allowed so we had an interesting example of the almost immediate usurping of the leadership by a young animal at the death of presumably its parent. Francis had remarkable eyesight, and when he once realized that I was interested in small birds and other objects, he would silently point out everything in our path. In this way I found a remarkable frog, which was so protected by its color and markings that I should never have discovered it by myself. I have mentioned it before as being of good size, earthen brown in color, and with a tall, thin, leaf-like ridge on the head over each eye, and a row of light gray tubercles like fringe down each side of the body. From the tip of the nose to the tail extended a narrow, pale, bluish line, and externally there seemed to be almost no differentiation between head and body. I heard red-billed toucans calling in a high tree, and stalking them, succeeded in shooting two, 
both males one younger than the other the coloring of their beaks was wonderfully brilliant and variegated their notes were of the robin song type few few although the resemblance to a puppy's voice was also strong they had been feeding on seeds with a pinkish pulp which francis called suluwafadi there were three toucans in this group and when the first old bird was shot the others returned and called continuously and loudly the third also came back to the same tree and i found that this was the adult female in this case as always i did not take the life of a living creature without some good reason for sport never but either as food or as in this instance as the only way to solve a problem of scientific interest i had noticed trios of toucans in many places and wondered whether the third bird was an extra female or young on the following day i observed no fewer than five separate trios of toucans of two species and now that i knew the dull colored upper tail coverts were a clue to the young bird of the year my high power stereo glasses showed me a single young in each instance we know practically nothing of the nesting habits of this group except from vague accounts so it is certain that in this region the rule is that only one young bird is reared to maturity the loud hollow whirring of the wings of these birds often drew our eyes up to the treetops and we had many opportunities of watching them feed the commonest way was for them to creep out as far as they dared to the branch tips and then craned their necks and bills to reach the fruit but often they adopted a more spectacular method a trio would beat heavily into a berry laden tree and perch quietly a few moments looking carefully in all directions for danger overhead for hawks and eagles beneath and around for monkeys opossums and snakes then one would launch out make a flying leap at a pendant cluster of fruit, clutch it frantically with its feet, and dangle and sway for ten seconds at a time, reaching out the while and filling its bill with the berries. Then, when the bird dropped, exhausted to a branch below, it would swallow what it had gathered. After shooting the toucans, I leaned my gun against a patch of black moss on a tree trunk. To my astonishment, the moss whirled outward and back, and then I saw it was a host of caterpillars, crowded as densely as they could be in a patch three feet high and forming a semicircle about the six-inch trunk. They were covered with black, branched, stinging hairs, with two longer tufted ones on the segments near the head. As Francis said, um worm's hairs bite hard. I began experimenting with their reaction motions. I found that any st sound or hiss, the snapping of fingers, whistling, hand clapping, or pounding on the metal or wood of my gun, caused absolutely no response on the part of the caterpillars. No matter how close to the creatures or how loud or sudden was the sound, unless they were touched, they did not move. On the contrary, any utterance of such sounds as biz, bo, bing, buzz, even when so low as hardly to rise above a whisper, caused every caterpillar of the many hundreds to react as one. The head with the long tufted appendage was jerked quickly backward, then down, and on the edge of the mass from side to side, those in the center, because of their position, had only the up and down flick. The effect as a whole was indescribable. An inconspicuous growth of moss was transformed like a flash into a seething, rearing mass of waving caterpillars. A suggestion altogether theoretical is that the reaction to the buzzy sounds may hint that the chief danger feared by these caterpillars is the fatal buzz of the wings of the ichneumon fly. This evening we added baboon and billbird to our venison, and were surprised to find the former tender and by no means devoid of taste.
the toucans were tough but more than one of us came back for a second helping of howler in spite of the cannibalistic shaft with which we were regaled the rain had increased in amount successively during the last three days and tonight a new sound was added to our nocturnal chorus the bubbling or gurgling frogs which by the score vented their joyful emotions in energetic gulps from the jungle at the edge of the clearing end of section twenty section twenty one of our search for a wilderness by mary blair b b this librivox recording is in the public domain april first having missed finding trumpeters yesterday francis promised them for today and we took a long tramp full of incident as usual we circled to the north swinging around beyond the first two valleys and then turning and describing a second curve intersecting the first two of the jungle wrens or quadrille birds sang their incomparable strains each with a theme of its own the first had two phrases which it uttered alternately thus there is absolutely no other bird song with which to compare it the timber when heard at a distance is that of the wood thrush quality sweet liquid and altogether ethereal but the distinctness of the notes and the remarkably intricate trios and gradations are wholly unique three or four large species of ant birds ran rapidly here and there holding their short tails erect and jerking them frequently thus presenting a decidedly railine appearance we saw several little tinamous in the course of the day one of which i shot when the cook cleaned it in the evening he found an egg about to be laid several days later a short distance from the clearing a bird of this species was flushed from a slight hollow between the buttresses of a mora the following day when the bird flew from the same spot it was found that an egg had been deposited it was of a burnished purple color and was thirty five by forty five millimeters in size although we knew that the egg had been laid less than twenty four hours before yet it contained an embryo corresponding to a four-day chick this fact in the case of these generalized birds may have some significance when we remember the advanced state of embryonic development characterizing the new laid eggs of many reptiles after an hour or more of the most careful stalking in a low swampy valley we heard the unmistakable thunderings of trumpeters or waracabras and my blood leaped in response long before i could hear them francis had distinguished the low booming note amid all the other jungle sounds i had studied specimens for months in the north and had searched in vain for any definite account of their habits and now although the briefness of my stay would permit of almost no chance for real investigation yet here at any rate were the birds themselves in their native haunts at last we flushed two which flew down from their perch with a sudden whirr of wings and ran swiftly out of sight as they flew they uttered the familiar chack chack these interesting birds have no near relations but form a sub order by themselves they run very swiftly but seldom use their wings and although they swim quite well rivers of any size are never crossed large flocks are sometimes met with but the birds travel more often in small parties they feed on the ground and roost in the tall trees the voice has many variations but the sound from which the name is derived is very loud and sonorous and can be heard at a great distance trumpeters are very common pets among the indians to whom they become greatly attached 
and although given full liberty in the midst of the dense bush they never attempt to return to their former homes when standing upright the trumpeter reaches a height of from eighteen to twenty inches the head and neck are black and covered with soft velvety feathers about a quarter of an inch in length and slightly recurved on the upper part of the breast and the lower part of the neck a purplish iridescence appears on the feathers while the rest of the plumage is entirely black with the exception of a brownish band across the back and the grayish plume-like secondaries the tail is very soft and does not exceed four inches in length and is indeed hidden by the wing feathers i made careful inquiry concerning the nesting of the common trumpeter so-called biographers have credited it with nesting on the ground or in a hole high up a tree laying from two to ten or more eggs which in the words of the describers are white dirty white or green i questioned francis at various times and could never get him to vary his answers he said that the trumpeter nested in the hollow of a tree and laid three four or five white eggs on another occasion i questioned the indian who hunted for mr nicholson at matope and he said the waracabra builds a nest of leaves well up in a tree and lays five white eggs while waiting for the trumpeters we heard the strange bare-headed katinga or calf bird the note has been compared to the lowing of a cow but to me it seemed much more musical resembling the humming of a goblet when one's moistened finger is rubbed around the rim the bird is yellowish brown with a bare head and keeps to the tops of the trees it is not shy however and can easily be approached and watched with the glass the most interesting discovery i made to-day was the elaborate courtship and challenge performance of the crested curassow in a low bit of valley with thick underbrush we put up a deer which dashed off before we could catch more than a glimpse of it it was followed by two agoutis one of which we gathered in for dinner the note of alarm of these rodents is a loud nasal wah then francis clutched my arm and by listening intently i could just hear a faint low mumbling it might have been a bumblebee a few feet away but the indian pointed to the east and said powies waracabras migo shootem laba which very plainly meant that there were curassows and trumpeters near me and that he would leave me to stalk and study them while he went to secure a toothsome paca for dinner i cached my gun in fact everything but my glasses and began creeping as silently as possible down the course of the little valley francis quietly amused smiled as i tied my handkerchief tenderfoot fashion to my gun expressing quite as much as a multitude of chafing remarks could have done foot by foot i pushed through or crawled under fallen trees and tangled vines and tree ferns close to the hot steaming forest mould with the low distant booming becoming ever more distinct the ventriloquial quality completely deceived me and long after i thought to see the performer i went on and on for many yards at last i turned to the south to gain the shelter of a great fallen tree which had begun to merge its rotten wood with the debris of the jungle floor I shall never forget pushing aside a mass of beautiful green orchids and slipping into a great hollow made by a second tree which had fallen athwart the first. Just beyond were three crested curassows, a male and two females, the latter busy scratching among the dead leaves, while the male was devoting himself to a most remarkable performance the splendid bird walks slowly up and down the clear space which he has chosen the entire body is tilted far forward the breast low and the wings pointing down in front the wrist portion or shoulder as it is often wrongly called
dropping almost to the ground the wing tips lie flat upon the back and the tail is raised while the head is held high almost touching the back and tips of the wings the tail carrying out the line of the back points straight upward and the white belly flanks and especially the under tail coverts are fluffed out to their greatest extent forming a most conspicuous white mark against the black of the remaining plumage now from a tree near by comes a low penetrating moan or muffled boom the bird in front of me at once changes his whole demeanor he continues his walking but it assumes more of a mincing character uttering all the while several notes like low but shrill squeaks or gurgles mingled with snorts and snores all rather subdued these seem rather hit or miss there being no regular sequence or similarity of the utterances several times these sounds are interrupted by the bird stopping appearing to pick up something and then to dash its head violently against its back producing a low champing sound which seems to excite the females who otherwise are wholly indifferent try as i may i can make nothing of this action and later it is an indiscreet impatient movement of mine at such a juncture that ultimately frightens the birds and ends my observations i was delighted therefore when observing the curassow in the north to see the bird repeatedly pick up pebbles or a feather or twig and champ them in its bill just as the wild bird did the clicking sound resulted only when a hard object was picked up but the dull fuds were made by the skull of the bird striking violently against its dorsal vertebrae the object it had picked up being held meanwhile in its bill the wild curassow soon drops whatever it has picked up and claps its wings together seven or eight times over its back making a loud slapping sound it then turns its back on its rival in the tree plucks nervously at the wings right and left for a full minute or longer and then reaches convulsively forward several times with its head and neck the bill being wide open gulping in a great quantity of air its abdominal air sacs swell its wings are lowered and rounded out until the bird appears half as large again as usual thus it stands half squatting with lowered head and tail and within a period of five to ten seconds utters usually four notes of the deepest and most penetrating character now that i am within a few yards they sound no louder than when several hundred yards away the exertion put forth shows this vocal effort to be a strenuous one and at the second performance the tones are rather low and confused but the normal utterance this climax of the whole challenge is as follows this may be imitated by anyone with a deep bass voice by humming the syllables um 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 to the notes as i have written them during this period the actor as observed in the captive specimen seems almost in a trance standing with half-closed eyes oblivious even of a hand resting on the feathers of his back and the recovery is slow the bird seeming dazed for a short time as i lay concealed in the guiana forest the whole performance was repeated five times in twelve minutes the curassow appearing most excited after it had finished the challenge call it frequently ran to the hens and walked about them while the captive bird which i observed paid no attention to the hens but showed off to human visitors and devoted himself to attacks upon their footwear no part of the performance was ever omitted invariably he turned his back on his rival or observer invariably he first walked and snorted then champed and clapped his wings and finally sent out his challenge 
as i have said one may closely imitate this call and the birds as i learned on another occasion will respond to repeated calls and come within shooting distance taken altogether the performance was a most delightful insight into the lives of these little known birds and the complexity and intricate succession of the various maneuvers was remarkable as i have said at one of the pebble challenging periods i became so interested that i made a noise and three birds rose at once and whirred away while i retraced my steps i returned as carefully as possible and encountered a troop of small monkeys which passed close overhead sending down a rain of dead twigs they apparently have the habit of breaking off twigs when they are progressing leisurely as i observed this same unnecessary amount of falling twigs and branches on several other occasions when thus engaged they make a great racket uttering now and then plaintive inarticulate sounds when once they spy you beneath them a sudden chorus arises like the greatly exaggerated swearing of a red squirrel and off they go rapidly silently with not a sound of breaking branches finding a good point of vantage not far from my gun and bag i waited for francis squatting coolly fashion out of respect to the bete rouge which were numerous and enthusiastic at this point i sat there five minutes and not a moment was devoid of interest i accidentally snapped a stick and like an electric spark came a sharp zzz at my very elbow i jumped as if an electric shock had indeed accompanied it and then broke another stick again the zzz snapped in answer and close to my resting place i discovered a six o'clock bee as the natives call these giant cicadas cicada grossa like the curassow he was on the kivive for rivals and ready with his challenge as often as I snapped a stick, he whirred out an answer. A pair of blue and yellow macaws screamed. When heard in the distance, all harshness is eliminated from their voices, and an extremely human quality of sound is acquired, as of one person calling in a high tone to another. A green cacique whirred overhead, told his cow-bell and strutted with slow elaborateness suddenly a pair of trumpeters came into view but saw me at the same instant and with loud chacks fled in all haste going on to our meeting place i almost stepped on francis who had been quietly watching me and resting after having returned with a load of game we struck the broken twig trail on which we secured the old howling monkey yesterday and a few hundred yards from the spot we heard the young male roaring he had improved wonderfully on his falsetto yell of yesterday and except for a general weakness of volume and an occasional break and tendency to get out of breath he made a good showing in the vocal gymnastics of his race twice after this we ran across the youngster and each time he was howling but entirely alone he had not yet secured a mate and his mother and aunt had apparently deserted him upon his assumption of leadership a half hour's walk close to the clearing this afternoon revealed birds everywhere in flocks passing leisurely small woodpeckers were tapping wood hewers picking and prying ant birds peering under leaves and twigs and the flycatchers audibly snapping up insects in mid-air the jungle was filled with d d d's chirps chacks low mewings and whistles while a rain of falling leaves ripe berries dead twigs and bits of bark marked the progress of the flocks i shot a number of birds which were new to me one of which i could not find until ten minutes search when i discovered it a line of ants five yards long had formed and it was covered with their bodies so swiftly do tropical scavengers work i secured a wedge-billed pygmy wood hewer with its single young one which must have left the nest that very day 
curiously enough the latter perched as often as it clung to the tree trunks and keeping this in mind i found that the measurements of the two birds were very interesting there was almost no difference between the length of the wings and beaks of parent and young but the tail of the young bird was only one and seven sixteenths inches in length as compared with four and three-fourths inches in the adult from this it appears that the climbing habit is not developed as early in the young wood hewer as in woodpeckers in which it seems instinctive from the first resting my camera for a moment against the buttress of a giant mora a small brown bird flew out and i recognized another wedge-billed pygmy wood hewer it flew to a sapling and peered at me around the side when i did not move away it came nearer and voiced its disapproval by a five-syllabled cry chick 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 this made me suspicious and peering down a narrow crevice formed by a deep fold in the buttress i caught a glint of white and finally made out three eggs one of which seemed to be freshly broken a safer or cozier place could not be imagined the crevice was eighteen inches deep and only two inches wide with the opening of the fold almost closed by a small dangling bush rope the nest itself was only two feet above the ground the eggs were pure white and were laid on a thin network of rootlets and fibers resting on the black mold which had collected in the crevice the following day it took me two hours of hard work cutting and sawing to reach the nest and when milady spooned up nest and eggs four good-sized scorpions came with them unpleasant guests i should think there were two eggs in the nest and a broken one on the ground outside which the parent had removed the night before the egg had probably been broken by the hurried flight of the parent on the preceding day the eggs were a broad oval in shape dull white and both measured twenty by sixteen millimeters four other pairs of birds were nesting on this side of the clearing yellow-winged honey creepers jungle wrens two pair of white-throated robins and a guiana quail or dora quara this last i found wholly by accident as i was watching a dragonfly which had been injured by a small flycatcher good-sized pieces were bitten out of the two hind wings and one of the others was doubled and broken yet the brave little insect was far from giving up and had managed to fly slowly albeit with a heavy slant to one side the loose wing making a whizzing sound as it vibrated i followed to see its ultimate fate as it passed the end of a log a green lizard leaped from a leaf and seized the unfortunate insect in mid-air thus typifying the anlaga of bird flight the lizard fell full length upon a rounded pile of dead leaves and like a bomb there shot forth the whirring form of the quail which scaled off between the trees we found the dura quara had rocketed from a tunnel about a foot in length made of twigs and dead leaves which led to a round hidden nest cavity containing four white eggs one of which was broken on the following day the quail had removed all trace of broken egg and shell so completely was the nest a part of the jungle floor that never except by accident would we have discovered it day after day on every tramp we took we were more and more impressed with the myriad examples of protective form and coloration as i have said before it is the immense variety rather than the exactness of detail which makes these resemblances so effective i became so confused at times that repeatedly i would net a falling leaf or blossom or even fire at an imaginary bird or on the other hand fail altogether to notice some rare bird or insect until i passed on some distance and happened to turn around for instance while walking along i saw something drift down and catch on a leaf i thought to myself this is surely an insect 
although a most remarkable mimic then i bent over and examined it closely lifting the branch close to my eyes and decided it was nothing but a dead leaf half curled and shriveled up as i turned away i swooped at it idly with my net and lo it took to flight and cost me several yards of hard pursuit before i secured it again the irregularity of its wings their leaf brown color edged with a line of yellow and the remarkable drifting flight in full sunshine all helped to deceive me it was a moth gonodonta pyrgo the gold birds although the size of large thrushes are absolutely indistinguishable in their garb of dull brown in the shadowy mid forest neither descending to the ground nor ascending to the sunlit treetops almost as common as the piercing whee whee o oh! of the gold birds was a less loud but penetrating chuckle dee dee which we heard almost as soon as we entered the shadows of the jungle three days of intermittent search passed before we discovered the author of this omnipresent sound the notes seemed to come from the treetops and we unconsciously held in our mind a bird at least the size of the gold bird imagine our surprise when after searching the branches with aching necks we finally detected the bird in the very act finding it perched only about ten feet above our heads it was a veritable mite of a bird the golden crowned mannequin clad in forest green with a tiny crown spot of yellow from head to tail he measured less than three inches and of all the marvels which we have encountered in our travels the most remarkable was how such a tiny creature considerably smaller than our own ruby crowned kinglet could produce such a tremendous volume of sound his chuckle dee dee can easily be heard a hundred yards away through the dense forest once identified it was an easy matter to locate these little mannequins they love the deep damper parts of the woods and were ridiculously tame perching quietly and calling continuously when one walked around within arm's reach we discovered the nest of one of these birds a short distance from the mine clearing in a sapling about seven feet from the ground a very frail affair suspended in the fork of a branch it was merely a thin cup of fine bush threads and rootlets while two or three small leaves were fastened to the bottom with strands of cobweb one could see through it anywhere it was only one and three-fourths inches across and three-fourths of an inch deep inside the cup the bird was on the nest and refused to leave until we lifted her off and photographed her then she flew and chuckled dee deed with all her little power while insects were far from rare in the jungle itself they were present in myriads in the little fallen tree clearings blue morphos flashed in and out of the thickets while white spotted clicking ones snapped back and forth in the darker recesses the transparent ghost butterflies flew silently and almost invisibly while heliconias threaded the vines giant bees buzzed past now and then one which i caught was an inch and a half long with tremendously thick and hairy hind legs an orange collar across the front of the thorax and an equally broad band of yellow on the abdomen centis americana among the most interesting birds which we found nesting were dusky parrots about one hundred yards from the clearing we observed two red-breasted parrots fly from a hole about forty feet up in a tall dead kakarali tree we watched the tree morning and afternoon for several days often for an hour at a time but never saw nor heard anything of the birds fearing that we had been deceived in thinking they were nesting we had a black cut down the tree but no sooner had the dust settled from the debris of rotten wood than a chorus of raucous cries arose and four young parrots nearly fledged were gathered into a hat the quartet showed an interesting sequence of growth 
there being several days difference between each one the youngest was clad only in quill like blood feathers number two had the scapulars part of the crown the breast and a half inch of the tail feathers out of the sheath number three was pretty well feathered except for face throat underwings and sides while number four was to all intents and purposes a real parrot the way in which the old birds kept hidden was remarkable one day milady and i started out with only the lay of the land and a compass for guide and walked straight toward that unknown region lying to the northwest a whole chapter could be written of our observations on that single tramp but i shall keep our notes for future work on the natural history of this region and add to this already too lengthy account only a few paragraphs we saw many lavender jays restless and numerous yet curious to know what manner of beings we were their alarm note keo accompanied us for a long distance later in the morning we spent some time watching a dense line of parasol ants they were as gay as fifth avenue on easter sunday being laden with the purple and white blossoms of some forest tree the broad wavering banners interspersed with those insects which bore stamens and pistols lance-like presented a most humanly comical appearance the tiny creatures are so serious and in such a hurry and yet look so tipsy and political that one never tires of watching them black clouds and a high wind overtook us and we walked rapidly on looking for some sort of shelter we were lucky enough to discover a huge tree hollow even to the center of the buttresses and this we made our headquarters during the storm from each of four natural windows we watched the jungle life during the rain a small patch of the black caterpillars was near by on a light barked tree all reacting or not according to whether we ejaculated s or bzz as before they were very conspicuous and made no attempt at concealment although at a distance they resembled a black knot hole on the trunk but their role was evidently to depend on their threatening actions and their even more reliable stinging hairs on the very floor of our shelter a tragedy was enacted a small wasp notogonia species less than an inch in length with a splash of gilt on thorax and head dashed upon a brown cricket grillus argentinus more than twice its size and stung it then the wasp left its prey and ran off about eight inches to a round hole which it had excavated in the black wood mold back to the cricket again it came turned it right side up seized it by the head and began to drag it along although i can hardly credit the wasp with the conscious intention yet its sting had certainly been delivered in exactly the right spot the whole cricket was paralyzed except for the two front pair of legs the motor nerves of these were unaffected and they kept up a convulsive pulling and pushing which aided the wasp greatly in its difficult task indeed the wasp did little but straddle its prey and steer while the cricket pushed itself along just before the latter disappeared still kicking into the hole the wasp stung it again and laid a small curved white egg on one of the hind legs of the cricket the hole was just the right bore to admit the body of the victim and was six inches deep as soon as the sun came out huge metallic buprested beetles boomed about the trunk and the wood hewers began their sweet scale songs and close over our heads a tiny golden crowned mannequin joined in with his chuckle dee dee the effort almost lifting him from his perch in offering these notes on the jungle life about the aremu clearing i have purposely refrained from classifying them as i wish the reader to realize how in this region of superabundant life events crowd in upon one insect bird flower animal without apparent rhyme or reason yet they really pass in splendid sequence 
the key to which lies in the ultimate relation of each to the other some day if we do not delay until the destroying hand of man is laid over this whole region we may hope partially to disentangle the web then instead of a seeming tangle of unconnected events all will be seen in their real perspective the flower adapted to the insect the insect hiding from this or that enemy the bird showing off its beauties to its mate or searching for its particular food these things can never be learned in a museum or zoological park or by naming a million more species of organisms we must ourselves live among the creatures of the jungle and watch them day after day hoping for the clue as to the why the everlasting why of form and color action and life end of section 21 End of chapter 10. Section 22 of Our Search for a Wilderness by Mary Blair Beebe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 11 The Life of the Iberi Savannas by C. William Beebe we had made two successful expeditions into the jungle or bush of guiana and now our third and last trip was to be in the open savanna region in the eastern portion of the colony near the coast the first resident american to welcome us to british guiana was mr lindley vinton who with mrs vinton did all in their power to make our stay in georgetown a pleasant one their house was made our home and certainly no strangers in a strange land were ever made more welcome than we were mr vinton is a living refutation of the statement that continued residence in the tropics invariably results in loss of energy for seldom even in our own virile country can one find a man more full of vitality at the time of our visit he was interested in several large concessions one of which was a rice growing proposition on the aberi river when he promised kanje pheasants or hoatzins in his back yard and thousands of ducks flying past every day we smiled as we remembered the hoatzins in the depths of the venezuelan mangroves but exaggerated as we believed his enthusiastic reports to be we were glad indeed to accept his invitation to spend a week at the bungalow on the rice plantation we ultimately found that he had actually understated the conditions of bird life on the aberi on april twelfth Milady and i took the funny little compartment train for a berry bridge or as our ticket read velladrum which we reached at nine thirty after two hours slow ride the land along the coast is all flat savanna dotted for the first half of the journey with tumbled down coolie huts and tiny diked fields of pale green young rice later for some distance these gave place to large groves of coconuts on the left stretched the sea-wall dikes relics of dutch industry perfected by the english throughout the entire journey hundreds sometimes thousands of birds were in sight often for several miles in succession but as exactly similar scenes were later visible and at closer range on our upriver trip I will not repeat myself the train was stopped for our benefit at the bridge across the so-called aberi river which proved to be a little stream only about a hundred and twenty-five feet wide loading our luggage and ourselves into a fussy little launch we chugged up river for three hours along the right bank the leeward for most of the distance grew an irregular fringe of bushes and low trees beyond almost to the horizon stretched the vast savanna covered with reeds rushes and tall coarse grass each a pure culture in its place of occurrence 
scattered over this great expanse were myriads of birds of many species the only other visible living creatures being a small herd of half wild cattle here and there for the first few miles two species predominated as they had almost all the way from georgetown the little yellow-headed and the red-breasted blackbirds few more beautiful sights can be imagined than a cloud of these birds rising ahead of the train or launch and scattering far and wide over and through the reeds the general color of both is a rich black which itself contrasts strongly with the green of the savanna but when we add to this the brilliant yellow head and neck of the former and the scarlet throats breasts and wing edges of the latter the color scheme is one which is never forgotten the two species would rise in distinct flocks perhaps six or eight hundred of each flow up and over the tall grass in two living waves of scarlet and gold and then intermingle the rain of red and yellow sparks being gradually quenched by the green expanse as the birds settled among the shelter of the reeds of course these flocks were composed only of those individuals close to the track or the river bank how many myriads were scattered over the savanna we shall never know we must have flushed a great many thousand of these two species in the course of the day and scattered among them were a few guiana meadow larks looking much like our northern birds every few dozen yards over the savanna a tall white figure stood motionless silently watching us american egrets distributed for their day's fishing hundreds dotting the marsh each solitary statuesque among them was a sprinkling of wood ibises and beautiful cocoy herons these latter were much shyer than the others and all within a hundred yards of us would take to flight as we passed leaving their more fearless comrade fishers in full possession all these herons soon became a common sight and we swept mile after mile of savanna with our glasses seeing nothing but the white birds dotted everywhere at last we were rewarded and a giant white stork came into sight towering above the herons with black head and neck and the sun reflected from the distended scarlet skin of the lower neck the bill had the faintest of tilts upward and we knew we were looking for the first time at a living jabiru the biggest and perhaps the rarest wading bird of our continent it stands fully five feet in height and the spread of the wings is about eight feet soon appeared another a half mile further on and a third and before our journey's end we had seen at least a dozen of these splendid birds we have but one or two meagre descriptions of its nesting and i therefore have included among the illustrations a most interesting one taken by dr bingham showing a jabiru on its nest together with its two half-grown young these birds do not nest on the guiana savanna but retire at the rainy season far into the interior spur-winged jacanas in loud crackling pairs were everywhere showing conspicuously against the green reeds dark chocolate when at rest and flashing pale yellow in flight guiana cormorants and snake birds rose or dived ahead of the launch twenty of the former taking refuge in one small tree as we passed hawks were abundant and one of the most numerous was the cream-headed hawk which soared low over the savanna or perched on the shrubs along the bank small birds showed no fear of it often alighting in the same tree from almost every bush along the river bank little guiana green herons flew up from their nests built close to the surface of the water these herons froze like bitterns when they alighted standing motionless with the bills at an angle of forty-five degrees 
along the railroad they were semi-domesticated flying fearlessly in and out of the coolie yards and snatching bits of food from the very doorways of the huts about eleven o'clock on rounding a sharp turn in the river we saw what appeared to be great expanses of burnt marsh on and on we went and at last we realized that we were looking at vast phalanxes of ducks suddenly without warning a living sheet of birds rolled up from the ground hung a moment then gained momentum and wheeled upward thousands began to rise at once until for fifty or a hundred yards on each side of the river there was an almost unbroken wave of birds flying upward and backward from this mass of life giving forth a medley of shrill whistles which soon deepened into a perfect roar of wings single lines of ducks detached themselves shooting out in all directions passing up and across the river or right and left out over the savannah they were gray-necked tree ducks with a plentiful scattering of the rufous and a very few white-faced the great curving wave never ceased for a moment as we approached but widened and thickened and wheeled over and behind us until the sky was pitted with their bodies i took picture after picture with my graphics the ground glass reflecting a myriad of swiftly moving forms then the ducks which had first arisen having flown in a great circle over the savannah returned and intersecting the newly arisen host formed a criss-crossing maze which carpeted the heavens with a close warp and woof of living birds even in mexico where we had watched the vast flocks of ducks and geese on lake chapala there was nothing to equal this the ducks looked dark against the sunlight but whenever they veered the white wing bands flashed like mirrors we counted the birds in one short line near us and found there were four hundred and twenty individuals no one could count those in even one of the flocks but there must have been at least twenty thousand in the first phalanx we encountered as we passed on many hundreds settled again on their feeding grounds where nothing was visible of them save a myriad heads and necks stretching high and watching us curiously as many others however flew far away the dense matted flocks fraying out into long single or double lines some of which must have been a half mile in length in this region these birds are tree ducks only in name as later in the year hundreds of eggs will be found scattered over the savannah and sooner or later the flocks will dissolve into pairs each to nest on some low hummock in the marsh these ducks never settle on the open water of the river on account of the many dangers swimming beneath of which more anon they sleep and feed and nest among the thick growth of reeds and grass of the savannah itself after passing the second main body of tree ducks we now and then heard a louder whistle of wings and a family flock of four or five great black muscovy ducks would rush past the leader the drake being almost twice the size of the members of his harem small birds were not much in evidence from the launch although anise were abundant fluttering awkwardly among the bushes and the big kiskadees were nesting about every hundred yards this was the first time in the colony that we had seen these latter birds nesting away from human habitations so this open savanna region would appear to be their natural home while the other yellow tyrants frequent wooded river banks at one o'clock we came in sight of a barn-like shelter in which was housed a huge steam traction plow and radiating out across the savannah were the lines of dikes which marked the great fields intended for rice planting 
a few minutes more of steaming brought us to a landing place on a small island with the bungalow in the center this islet and in fact this whole region has an interesting history all this savanna was once a densely wooded jungle of mora trees etta palms and other growth in 1837 a drought occurred of such extent that all the vegetation trees palms and underbrush became dry as chips the inevitable followed and a fire started in some way which swept this whole region reaching in places even to the demerara then floods came broke through the loosened barrier of tangled roots and infiltrated through the soil grass and reeds took the place of the great moras and now almost to the horizon stretches the flat open expanse of marsh indeed it is only to the west that trees are visible where two miles away etta bush begins in the tops of these palms the black muscovy ducks make their homes feeding out on the marsh and bringing down their young so it is reported in their beaks sixty years ago or thereabouts many runaway slaves fled into the interior most of them hiding in the recesses of the bush or high woods these lived either with the indians in many cases intermarrying with them or founded settlements by themselves some of these unfortunate blacks however made their way up the abari and when they had come thus far eighteen miles finding no habitable land they set to work to make an island in the midst of this then as practically now unexplored region these desperate men toiled at the black muck of the river edge scooped it up and packed it on the foundation of reeds until a more or less dry island of about five acres had been formed here today we found a low mound of rich black mold with nine good-sized isolated trees several coconut palms and a few bananas corn planted here grows with wonderful rapidity the long occupancy and numerous inhabitants of the islet is attested by the thousands of pieces of pottery with which the ground is covered on some i found a rude attempt at decoration and the shape of the rims and handles were much like the primitive african art of today there was probably a low hummock or mound as the nucleus for the island and four or five feet beneath the surface several indian stone axes have been unearthed telling of still earlier human habitation perhaps in the days of the jungle here we had planned to spend a week but were prevented by an accident from remaining more than three days but even in the short space of thirty-six hours of daylight we learned much of the life on and about this islet our two other trips had been to tiny islands of cleared ground in the midst of a sea of the densest jungle here we were marooned in the shade of a little isolated group of trees on a diminutive hillock of earth bounded in all directions by an impenetrable marsh if one so much as took a single step from the island it was into three feet or more of water and tangled reeds too dense to push a boat through during the rainy season boats can be pulled through and at the dry season firmer footing is possible but our visit was at a time betwixt and between i have made a small rough plan of our domain on the abari figure 147 the river was at this point only about seventy-five feet in width flowing almost due south as we ascended it a narrow inlet became visible in the right bank which led into a good-sized lagoon about as wide as the river which had probably been formed by the excavation of the marsh this lagoon bounded the north and part of the east sides of the island the prevailing wind was from the east and this probably accounted for the line of small trees and bushes 
being almost altogether on the western bank. We were welcomed at the bungalow by Mr. Harry, the young American engineer in charge, who, without the ornate phrases of Spanish hospitality, but in the simple American manner, put the bungalow and everything at the plantation at our disposal. Nothing more different from what we encountered in the bush can be imagined. There no sunlight save what sifts down through the tall trees. Here a blaze of light from horizon to horizon. There hosts of living creatures, but as a rule single individuals of a species or in pairs. Here unnumbered hosts in flocks of many thousands of the same species it was a wonderland guarded by stern guardians teeming with life on land in the air and in the water not a moment of the day or for that matter of the night was free from sight or sound of some of these interesting creatures first as to the guardians the sun we found to be a most terrible menace on the quiet open waters and an exposure of an hour would have resulted in most painful blisters and these in the tropics are of a more serious moment than in the north with broad-brimmed hats however there was no danger the day even out on the marsh itself was comparatively free from insects but at five thirty a few mosquitoes appear by six o'clock one would call them numerous and between six thirty and seven thirty they are legion and ferocious one cannot sit still unprotected for a moment at a time after seven thirty they all disappear especially when there is a light wind but at nine o'clock they are present in full numbers again we slept the first night or rather lay down on cots with nets the mosquitoes or most of them could apparently easily make their way through the mesh but when swollen with blood failed to escape again we slept but little kept awake by the biting and humming of the wretches from daybreak when we arose until about nine o'clock sand flies held high revel biting severely after which all the insect pests vanished and one could decide to postpone suicide until the coming night after this however we used close cloth nets which defeated the efforts of the mosquitoes we found so much to interest us on and in the immediate vicinity of the islet that we made no extended trips either up or down the river in the three days we lived there we observed the following fifty species of birds nineteen of which marked with asterisks were nesting on the islet or within a few yards of it red underwing dove asterisk hoatzin asterisk wood rail purple gallinule great billed tern eyebrowed tern asterisk jacana wood ibis jabiru kokoi heron american egret asterisk guiana green heron horned screamer muscovy duck rufus tree duck gray-necked tree duck guiana cormorant snake bird black vulture yellow-headed vulture caracara south american blue hawk asterisk south american black hawk asterisk rufus kingfisher parauque goat sucker green hummingbird little rufus cuckoo smooth billed ani asterisk cinnamon spine tail asterisk pied ground flycatcher asterisk white headed flycatcher asterisk cenarius toady flycatcher asterisk guiana kiskadi tyrant asterisk lesser kiskadi tyrant asterisk large billed kiskadi tyrant asterisk white-throated kingbird tree swallow 
variegated swallow barn swallow asterisk gray breasted martin red breasted swallow asterisk guiana house wren asterisk black capped mocking thrush asterisk pygmy seed eater little yellow headed blackbird red breasted blackbird meadowlark asterisk yellow oriole little boat tailed guiana grackle the most interesting of all were the hoatzins whose raucous squawks brought vividly to our minds the mangrove swamps of venezuela where we had studied them last year as i have said the east bank of the river is for the most part clear of growth save for the reeds and grasses of the savanna along the western bank is a dense shrubby or bushy line of vegetation occasionally rising to a height of twenty or thirty feet or again appearing only two or three yards above the reeds beyond the brush grows altogether in the water and consists chiefly of a species of tall arum or mucka mucka as the natives call it frequently bound together by a tangle of delicate vines here and there is a low light barked tree-like growth this narrow ribbon of aquatic growth was the home of the hoatzins and from one year's end to another they may be found along the same reaches of the river in general their habits did not differ from those of the birds which we observed in venezuela throughout the heat of midday no sight or sound revealed the presence of the birds but as the afternoon wore on a single raucous squawk would be heard in the distance and we knew the hoatzins were astir directly in front between the bungalow and the river as may be seen from my diagram the brush had been cut away on either hand for a distance of about sixty yards every evening from four thirty to five thirty p m the hoatzins gathered on the extreme northern end of this wide break in their line of thickets until sometimes twenty-five or thirty birds were in sight at once some would fly down to the low branches and begin to tear off pieces of the young tender shoots of the maka maka with much noise and flapping of wings several made their way to a single bare branch which projected out over the cleared marsh the first bird would make many false starts crouching and then losing heart but the next on the branch getting impatient at last nudged him a bit and at last he launched out into the air with rather slow wing beats but working apparently with all his power he spanned the wide extent of cleared brush then the ten feet of water then fifteen yards more of stumps and with a final effort he clutched a branch and his goal was reached after several minutes of breathlessness he continued on his way out of sight into the depths of the brush the second hoatzin would then essay the feat but fail ignominiously and fall midway coming down all of a heap among the stumps here a rest was taken and for five or ten minutes the bird would feed quietly then a second flight carried it back to the starting point or to the end of the open space sometimes when the birds alighted and clutched a twig they would be so exhausted that they toppled over and hung upside down for a moment watching the hoatzins carefully with stereos for several evenings in succession we came to know and distinguish individual birds two of which had a broken feather in the right wing and the other a two inch short central tail feather were excellent flyers and taking their leaping start from the high branch never failed to make their goal going the whole distance and alighting easily all of the others had to rest and one which was molting a feather in each wing could achieve only about ten yards this one fell one evening into the water at the second relay flight and half flopped half swam ashore 
one evening a hoatzin flew toward us and alighted near some hens on the ground but took wing almost instantly back to this brushwood a day or two before we came one of the birds had used a beam of the porch as a perch this general movement occurred at both sunrise and sunset and was always as thorough and noisy as we found it the first evening of our stay for months we were told it had been kept up as regularly as clockwork in the morning as the sun grew hotter the birds became quiet and finally disappeared not to be heard or seen again until afternoon they spent the heat of the day sitting on their nests or perched on branches in the cooler deeper recesses of their linear jungle the last view of them in the morning as the heat became intense or late in the evening usually revealed them squatted on the branches in pairs close together on moonlight nights however they were active and noisy and came into the open to feed the habit of crouching or settling down on the perch is very common with the hoatzins and it may be due to the weakness of the feet and toes i am inclined however to consider it in connection with the general awkwardness in alighting and climbing as a hint of the unadaptability of the large feet to the small size of the twigs and branches among which they live inexplicable though it may appear the hoatzin although evidently unchanged in many respects through long epochs yet is far from being perfectly adapted to its present environment it has a severe struggle for existence and the least increase of any foe or obstacle would result in its extinction at the time of our arrival the hoatzins had just begun to nest they were utilizing old nests which although so apparently flimsy in construction yet were remarkably cohesive the nests are almost indistinguishable from those of the chows or guiana green herons which were built in the same situations the latter were usually low over the water while the hoatzins were higher from five to twelve feet above the surface of the marsh the twigs were longer and more tightly interlaced in the hoatzin's nest and while the nests of the heron crumbled when lifted from the crotch the others remained intact the hoatzins placed their nests in crotches of the tree-like growths or more rarely supported by several branched mucka mucka stems both sexes aided in the building as we observed two birds collecting and weaving the twigs three sets of eggs which came under our observation numbered respectively two three and four from what information i could gather two seems to be the usual number the eggs are rather variable in shape one which i have from the orinoco is elliptical while my aberry specimens are oval the ground color is creamy white the entire surface is marked with small irregularly shaped dots and spots of reddish brown inclining to be more abundant at the large end the brown pigment deposited early in the oviduct is covered by a thin layer of lime and thereby given a lavender hue the size averages one point eight by one point three inches Hoatzins seem to be very free from enemies, although from year to year their numbers remain about the same. The waters beneath them are inhabited by numbers of otters, crocodiles, anacondas, and voracious fish, so that death lies that way. They seem also to fear some predatory bird, for whenever a harmless caracara hawk skimmed low over the branches on the lookout for lizards the hoatzins always tumbled pell-mell into the shelter of the thick foliage below we found that the best time to approach and photograph the birds was during their siesta as we paddled along the bank they scrambled from their perches or nests up to the bare branches overhead calling hoarsely to one another 
pushing aside the dense growth of arums and vines we worked our canoe as far as possible into the heart of the bush to the foot of some good-sized tree perhaps a foot in diameter stepping from the boat to the lowest limb milady would hand me the big graflex with the unwieldy but necessary twenty-seven inch lens and i began my painful ascent at first all was easy going but as i ascended i broke off numerous dead twigs and from the broken stub of each issued a horde of black stinging ants these hastened my ascent and at last i made my way out on the swaying upper branches from here i had a fairly clear view of the surrounding bush and if i worked rapidly i could secure three or four pictures before the hoatzins took flight and hid amid the foliage of all my pictures that of figure one hundred fifty seven is the prize we came upon a flock of hoatzins late in the afternoon and were fortunate enough to get into a clear space and to photograph eleven on the same plate the confused mass near the center of the picture containing four individuals figure one hundred forty eight shows the character of the country where we found the hoatzins on a berry river with the line of dense growth on one side and the level savanna on the other a study of an individual pair of birds is given in figures one fifty two to one fifty six and the actions of these two birds were so typical of hoatzins that an account of them will apply to the species in general i made these photographs from a boat standing on the thwarts while milady guided it through the brush we flushed the female from her nest marked by a circle in figure one fifty and she flew to a branch some eight feet higher figure one fifty two the male then appeared from a tree beyond center of figure one fifty two we remained perfectly quiet and the next photograph shows her tail on looking about while the male who has flown nearer is watching us suspiciously figure 154 shows the male on another perch still more alarmed and a moment later he thrashed his way out of sight meanwhile the female had rediscovered us and crouched down figure 155 hoping to avoid observation but as we pushed closer to the nest she rose on her perch spread tail and wings to the widest figure 156 her scarlet eyes flashing and uttering a last despairing hiss launched out for a few yards at this moment as may be seen in the same picture a second pair of birds left their nest in the next clump of undergrowth and raised their discordant notes in protest at our intrusion the assertion which we made last year milady having been the first to observe it that hoatzins used their primaries as fingers in the same way that the chicks and partly grown young use their wing claws has been received with some doubt and i am glad to offer a photograph figure one fifty six as evidence in the right wing of the hoatzin the thumb feathers are plainly visible with their inner edges fretted away while the first six primaries also show signs of severe wear such as would be expected from the rough usage to which they are put attention is called to the apparent immobility of the crest which is as fully erect in the crouching hoatzin figure one fifty five as in the same bird a minute or two later alert and about to fly figure one fifty six thus it was that we took the first photographs ever made of these most interesting birds End of section 22